success they depends upon agriculture and agriculture depends on a thriving natural world looking at more than just climate impact but also looking at impact on biodiversity and nature as a whole be clearer on the urgency of taking action for nature. And if we continue on the current path, I say we in the collective sense, of degradation of nature, of habitat loss, biodiversity loss and so on, then our supply chains are at risk. The situation where we are consuming more than what natural capital can regenerate must be resolved as soon as possible. The first step in the process is really understanding where is your impact and what is material for your business. designed frameworks and methodologies can help improve a company's own initiatives and make it easier to learn from the best practices of others. So for us, working on having more resilient supply chains and managing those risks is critical to ensure business continuity. The time is now for nature to be integrated into business strategies and for organisations to recognise the value of nature to their business. we need behind these nature goals are internationally recognized frameworks and science-based measurement. That's why we've joined the Science-Based Targets Network Corporate Engagement Programme. Monday.com makes GANS great again. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well this afternoon. Thanks for coming and joining us today. I'm Erin Billman, I'm the Executive Director of Science Based Targets Network. And I'm um, really excited to be here with you in person to be bridging between uh, the virtual world that many of us have interacted in and, and this in-person one today. And so um, I just have a few uh, logistics I'd like to run through that I will go ahead and skip forward to. We are going to be using Slido in this event. It's going to be the opportunity to poll you um, to understand a little bit more about who's in, the, who's in the room and who's online following today, as well as um, an opportunity for you to provide questions that you have. We are going to have Q&A several sessions, and um, it will be done through Slido. So if you could please pull that up on your phone. Um, there are two opening questions to pull, and I'm going to follow along on my phone as well. So hopefully you're seeing on your phone two questions. What type of organization are you? And how familiar are you with science-based targets for nature? And I'm watching real time. Thank you for putting it up on the screen, team.
great to see a mix of first our, our target audience for this session, which are in fact the companies, as well as the nonprofits who are um, key to being both existing partners that form SVTN, as well as to help um, amplify our work, um, and other institutions that are gonna help influence. Familiarity, somewhat. Okay, that's very helpful. We've got some very as well. Um, for those that are in the somewhat and very category, please bear with us. We do want to make sure a, 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 a standard level setting um, is done um, that we'll make brief and then, and then get deeper into the content quickly. So if we could go back to the slides now. Here's what the session looks like today. We're going to be hearing first about the science behind science-based targets for nature with, with um, a speaker who I'll introduce momentarily. Um, then we'll hear from uh, SBTN's technical director on how this work is supporting the global deal for nature. We will have a corporate panel. I'm jumping ahead. First, we'll have an interview with Alpro about their experience working with us. And then we'll have a corporate panel. Um, and as I mentioned before, we will have Q&A at several points throughout. So please do use Slido for that purpose when the opportunity presents itself. Do we? We don't have another poll here. Did I go forward by accident? OK, there we go. So um, just a bit of context setting. We all know why we're here in terms of, of nature loss and biodiversity loss in particular. And um, it is having an incredible impact on human communities, which is in turn having huge implications for our economy. And so what we're doing about it with Science Based Tar Targets Network is aiming to provide a net zero nature positive pathway for business. Science-Based Targets Initiative has already shown the way in terms of climate science-based targets for companies. We are expanding on that to beyond climate, all the aspects in which a company is impacting in, um, the planet, as well as beyond companies to cities. Our focus of our current work is on the company side, uh, but we do like to make sure that full picture of cities is included as well. Happy to discuss that with those that are interested offline, but today we, we will focus on companies. When I say we, who do I mean? Science-Based Targets Network is not a standalone institution. We are a collection of the key leading NGOs and scientific organizations and other organizations teaming together to develop the guidance methods and tools for companies to set science-based targets. The power is in the partners. We have the founding partners shown on the page. There are many other partners that are part of SBTN. They're the ones that are leaning in to doing the work of developing our content. Together with the other key initiatives in the space, Business for Nature, Capitalist Coalition, TNFD, WBCSD, World Economic Forum, WWF, we have um, aligned on high-level business actions for nature that is meant to be an entry point or a gateway for companies to understand how this all knits together. So hopefully at some point um, while you've been here, you've heard about the ACT-D framework, Assess, Commit, Transform, Disclose. SVTN is primarily because of our mandate um, on the guidance for setting science-based targets, focusing on that commit bucket, although to do that well, we have enabling guidance across uh, ACT-D. And so that was meant to be just a, a very brief foundation setting. Now we're gonna get into the, the agenda itself for the session, and I would like to introduce David Obura. Uh, David is uh, a member of the Earth Commission, as well as a leading scientist from Kenya. He will tell you more about himself. The Earth Commission is the sister component of Science-Based Targets Network within the glo broader Global Commons Alliance, um, working on some of the scientific foundation that SBTN is using. And with that, David, and you can just scroll forward. 
Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I just have a, a few moments to tell you about the Earth Commission. I'm a coral reef scientist based in Kenya, um, working on sustainability issues uh, at that scale, and then also thinking out to global scales as well. And it's been a great process uh, trying to understand how we can understand, do the science we do in the Earth Commission, and feed it into practical applications through SBTN. So the Earth Commission is a group of, of 17 international scientists. We're co-chaired by Johan Rockström, Juita Gupta, and Dahe Kin. Um, we've aligned ourselves or organized into five different working groups looking at various aspects of planetary boundaries based on that framework and trying to understand how can we bring these planetary boundary concepts uh, into tangible areas uh, for companies and cities to use in understanding their contribution to remaining within limits uh, at the planetary scale. Uh, so we have the planet there. We have defined, we've conceptualized this as safe and just boundaries. Now this has taken about three years of work uh, to, to get through all of this. So it's been quite a long time and, and a very heavy process. Um, we have extended the planetary boundary concept to its origins, which is really the Earth system boundary concept. Um, and I think it's, that's a bit more of a scientific definition of that. But then also not just understanding about the stability of the Earth system, but once we have stability, is that just for everyone on the planet and assuring that, that safe limits are also just. And then we pass that work on to SBTN, as we'll be doing in, in, in coming months and years now as we move forward. Now, just a quick word on, on what the, the safe and just mean. Um, so on the right are the Earth system boundaries we've been looking at. I'll come back to those. But the safe side of it means looking initially at a fully planetary perspective. So there are thresholds or limits, such as for temperature, as we understand very well, uh, that if we exceed at planetary scales, that will have impacts um, across the planet. The point about these uh, thresholds is that they're not targets, of course. You know, they're limits. You want to stay away from them. Can, so can we identify a safe buffer or guardrail to stay away from those thresholds? And then a particular dynamic of many of these systems is this tipping elements. There are large regional or global scale tipping elements, such as the cryosphere, the ice systems, that have such a profound impact on the global climate that if they do go past the threshold, there may be cascading impacts on other tipping elements in the system and very rapid changes that we may not be able to reverse back through. So that's very concerning, trying to understand those dynamics. And then on the just side is we may be able to, for example, uh, stay within one and a half degrees if we stop all fossil fuel use immediately. But there's many countries in transition and societies that don't have alternative fuels. Um, they can't access uh, other fuels through, through perhaps through cost reasons or they're not available locally. So is it really just uh, to, to make them go through that? And there are two levels of justice we consider of uh, no harm and also access, uh, sort of a dignified life. Now, we looked at eight uh, Earth system boundaries. I focus on the biodiversity ones, being a, a biodiversity scientist. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on what that looks like, digging into those. And the other ones will, of course, be of interest to, to companies and cities working in different areas as well. Um, we looked at two complementary synthetic measures. So one is looking at, um, particularly at the global scale, these intact large ecosystems that are critical for planetary level functions, such as carbon sequestration. So we understand that quite well uh, for the Amazon rainforest, for example, and the importance of that system in regulating climate change. There's also, um, so biodiversity extinction risk is, can be considered as, as a global planetary boundary and that is uh, for which you require, you need to have a certain proportion of the land and ocean ecosystems intact in order to, to not tip into, into rapid extinctions. Of course, we're going slum, somewhat below that boundary at the moment. The second one we put a lot more time into because this is what really then touches to, to people's lives and this is something new and different, is considering many benefits that people depend on or nature's contributions to people using IPBES framing. Um, is that these are needed by, they act at local scales and it varies from hundreds of meters to a few kilometers, tens of kilometers. And how can we understand what's needed to ensure that these functions and services are available and accessible to people everywhere on the planet? And we've been coming up with a boundary of the amount of 
intact habitat or functioning habitat needed per square kilometer of land surface in this case to ensure the provisioning of these benefits. So this is all in papers that are coming up now and I can't give you a lot more detail than that unfortunately, but it's coming out soon. And I won't go into this slide, this is more interpreting some of these results for the global biodiversity framework and the context we're in now. And I'll hand back to Erin, thanks. Thank you, David. An impressive amount of work and stay tuned in 2023 for publications in two major journals, the, the peer-reviewed um, output from the Earth Commission. So congratulations on that being forthcoming. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Varsha Vijay, SBTN's technical director. Varsha. Thank you, Aaron, for that introduction, and David for that really excellent, I think, context setting of the science behind science-based targets. So David was talking to you about the definition of Earth system boundaries. Um, how to keep within those safe and just boundaries. So that science coming from the Earth Commission, other academic sources, our partner scientific organizations, is accompanied by identification of the ideal state of the environment, the ideal state of nature in locations where the company works. That value is then compared to these systemic boundaries, some of which are identified at the global scale and often need to be kind of translated or um, identified at a local scale using other modeling approaches. We then think about the amount of change that companies need to make to their pressures. And this is a really core area um, for SBTN's value in this space is that we're really addressing those primary drivers of biodiversity loss. We've heard context on the urgency. And so understanding how much each actor in a space here thinking specifically about the companies we work with as end users need to contribute towards achieving that target is really what the science-based targets are all about. And we're doing that through a five-step framework. We start first through the assessment of impacts. And that's really important. Here we're talking about materiality of the economic activities of a business applying an environmental and societal materiality perspective. Using that information, the company looks at where they're working and prioritizes action based on what's most urgent for action for nature. Moving forward, they set targets in line with the guidance we described, incorporating the best science to make sure that those targets are measurable, actionable, and time-bound. That process is all validated. And so that's a really important step towards accountability in this space, making sure that it fits exactly with this guidance and is sound science when applied. And of course, in doing this, we're kind of addressing that dual challenge of making sure that our, our, our um, guidance is both scientifically rigorous and applicable to our end user community to make sure that that target is not just set and left, but it's acted upon and measured um, against. So we can track progress to make sure that we're meeting our targets in the time frame set. SBTN approaches um, are being developed across Earth systems. So we're thinking about reducing carbon emissions, preserving freshwater resources and water security, supporting biodiversity and ecosystem services, preserving and regenerating land systems, and eventually through our work on oceans, securing healthy and diverse oceans. We're enabling companies to take the right actions at the right time and in the right places, and that's really critical here. That is going to enable companies to do their part to deliver the targets, the global targets in the global biodiversity framework. So connecting this more concretely, we like to think of the science-based targets as an important implementation mechanism for the global biodiversity framework. Of course, we want to ensure that the targets that are agreed upon here and put in place in the global biodiversity framework are ambitious, 
are effective. But once we have them, it will be the key opportunity for us all, both governments and non-state actors, to actually see them put in place and acted on. So for example, our targets, um, by that I mean science-based targets, are enabling integrated spatial planning, they're in enabling restoration and land systems through our methods on land impacts. We're addressing directly nutrient pollution and freshwater systems. We're thinking about climate through our partnership with our sister organization that you already heard about, Science-Based Targets Initiative, and their new developments um, for flag guidance. We're also thinking about those targets which are actually speaking to sustainable use and benefit sharing. So not just considering natural ecosystems and of course the critical responsibility to prevent conversion of natural ecosystems, but also thinking about what's happening inside anthropogenic landscapes, like in agriculture. Thinking critically about ecosystem services, you know, so nature's contributions to people. And finally, there's this really important piece about how we actually make sure that this is acted on. So the mainstreaming and integration of biodiversity into policies, regulations, and development processes, and a really special connection with Target 15, which is thinking about disclosure for companies of their impacts and dependencies, and also how to reduce those impacts by 50%. This, this framework and these methods play a critical role in ensuring that when this target is put in place that we actually see action there. So we started with this approach of our mitigation hierarchy, um, focusing on reducing negative impacts, moving through actions to increase positive impacts through regeneration and restoration of natural ecosystems, and through all of this, envisioning a world where we are taking action. I believe we have a video to show here, so I don't know if anyone can, can enable that. If not, maybe I can set the, the context. We've had a lot of discussion on nature positive here and what the definition of nature positive is. Well, this is defining a global goal in which we are halting and reducing negative impacts on nature and focusing on bending the curve of biodiversity loss. And if we're gonna get to that place, then we need to not only just tap track the degradation of natural ecosystems, look at the declines of biodiversities across dimensions, but we need to actually enable concrete actions in line with the best available science we have. So that's actions that are first addressing negative impacts and then increasing positive ones so that we make sure that we avoid unintended consequences of ignoring the kind of place-based relevance of nature. So what can you do right now? So we're looking at a really exciting time um, towards the release of our first version of our methodologies. Um, but there's already things that you could do now with our draft guidance. So you can start to understand your impacts and dependencies on nature. We have guidance already out there. So we have draft guidance that actually walks you through that process of screening and assessment. You can set interim targets following our guidance. We don't want to encourage inaction. We know how urgent it is to act to reduce impacts on nature. And third, you can actually lead the way through engaging with our corporate engagement program to ensure that you hear the latest about our technical developments, that you leverage every opportunity to interact with us. And for companies, I think this is really gonna be key to ensuring that when we do release our methods, I don't know if anyone can advance the slide for me. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, when we do have these methods released for freshwater systems, for land, and like I said, already through our connections to our partner organization for climate, that you're able to leverage the guidance. Over time, 
This is just our version one. So you can see right now that we present this systemic perspective across Earth systems, and that will only continue to grow with our guidance. We're looking forward to further developments in the marine space, to advances in our coverage of biodiversity. Um, and so with that, I'd love to hand over to people who have experience of actually using our methods. Um, and thank you all very much. Thank you, Varsha. Is the battery out on the clicker, or is it? OK. So we'll, uh, nope, it is working. <laughs> so um, we are going to move to specific experience. Just one um, note as I listen to um, Varsha um, that I think is a question that has come up a lot is, how, how is biodiversity covered in our version one? Um, and while it's grayed out, it's grayed out on that slide for version one because we're, we don't have bio, biodiversity specific target setting methods. However, our methods cover some of the most important drivers or the, the areas in which um, companies impact biodiversity, like, like land use, like freshwater use, like nutrient pollution, as well as using biodiversity data integrated into our, our assessment and prioritization steps. So it is covered to some extent. We look forward to continuing to build on that as the scientific consensus around what you measure and how on biodiversity continues to advance. So with that, I'd like to invite up to the stage one of our corporate engagement program members, Alpro. Ava? Okay. Let's do a test. Hello. Yeah. Is, are they both working? Great. Okay. So let's start with just, um, I'd like to give a little bit of an overview. Um, so we have Ava de Kayser, who is the Senior Sustainability Manager, Plant-Based Europe for Alpro. If you're not familiar with Alpro, Alpro is a plant-based brand of Danone producing plant-based alternatives to milk, yogurt, desserts, and cream, and was founded in the 1980s. Alpro also recently conducted a pilot on the initial steps of SBTN's five-step target setting framework, which Varsha just referred to, that helps companies assess and manage their impacts on nature in line with the global biodiversity framework, in particular, target 15. This pilot was conducted with the support of the lab na capital Natural, which I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation of in WWF France, and um, which works to develop methodological frameworks that place natural capital at the heart of economic models. And so, Eva, to, to set the broader context for this discussion, many of us are aware that the food sector is contributing up to a third of GHG emissions and is the primary driver of biodiversity loss, and that highlights the critical importance of transforming our food systems. How, how do you see Alpro supporting this transformation through science-based targets for nature that include and build on the climate ones? Yeah, so um, indeed, food has a big impact, but we are also highly dependent on nature, and we realize that very well, I think, anybody working in food. So at Danone, we really try to act a lot on biodiversity. We have a deforestation and uh, land conversion uh, policy. We work on watershed preservation, on regenerative agriculture. And we put that really in action through the brands, by the way we source our ingredients, um, by working with farmers on regenerative agriculture practices. And I think, uh, what, what we also feel, and definitely at Alpro, we have been on this journey for a long time, is that we try always to do better, but when will that be good enough? And when will it be enough? When, when can you... Uh, and, and also with how will you weigh that against all the other objectives you have as a company? And when you look at climate, um, I think everybody who is here, and we heard it a lot, I think these days, Climate and nature go hand in hand. We cannot reach the climate targets without restoring nature. We cannot restore nature without looking at our climate impact. And for us, the work we do with the SBTs for nature then is helping to make that bridge, to connect the two. And we're 
I think it, what is very important and what SBTN is offering us is to help us to speak by diversity within our organization, like we do already for carbon. When you speak uh, with higher management, you can speak about carbon, which is, was also very intangible 10 years ago, and now companies can speak about it, set their strategy. I think we need the same for biodiversity and with what we are doing with SBTN is working towards that and to close the gap. Um, how much is enough? We, we hear that that's the, the primary question um, that, that uh, we're trying to answer here. So let's get into some of the details on the actual pilot that you did on SPTs for Nature, beginning with step one, the assess step. Can you um, walk us through the key activities and insights Alpro took for this step? Yeah, so in our step one, which is assessing the impact of your value chain and of your full activities. So what we did there was a state of nature assessment where we looked at the pressure our activities have. And in our case, we did that, uh, we tailored that really to our strategy and to the way that we uh, structure our activities. So we did one analysis on our upstream stream ingredient sourcing, we did one on the direct operations, and then we did one on packaging, which is also an important part of our sustainability strategy. So we went to look uh, for each of these, uh, we called it then the business units in the assessment. For each one of them, uh, we did a combination of an impact assessment and a spatial analysis. So first we looked, for example, in ingredient sourcing, the impact growing a certain crop has, and you match that with the origin where you source that, uh, what is the risk or the sensitivity in that region. And by combining those two elements, we had uh, an index of risk for each combination of ingredient and location where we source it. And that step, uh, so it sounds very easy when I explain it now, and it's very uh, good to have that information, but reality is that it's quite complex to collect all those data you are facing, multi-stakeholder data collection. You need to dive into your supply chain, and you also hear, I think a complexity is to also decide when it's good enough. Like, when do you stop? When do you say, now we have this picture of our value chain, and we take the next step to dive in where we need to be? Uh, and I think as a company, it's also complex because it's something that we cannot do alone. You need partners for that. In this case, we were supported by Metabolic, a consultant who really guided us through it, helped us with the data, uh, make it very insightful, like presenting us good graphs that then we can use within our organization. Great, yeah, um, those implementation partners are, are key. We do have a list of service providers. Um, if you are looking for somebody to help you with, we don't provide a recommendation, but they are a list that have um, ensured that they're staying up to speed on our content as we develop it. Um, so I encourage you to use that resource if, if helpful for you. So, you know, as we turn our attention from step one, assessing to step two, interpreting and prioritizing, um, can you um, talk us through how it helped you um, focus on the places and parts of the business to get started on first? Yeah, so as a result of our step one, we uh, have this index of risk in five big categories. So we looked at deforestation risk, biodiversity loss, uh, water availability, water pollution, and land degradation. And then uh, we match that information with what is called our sphere of influence. So looking where do we already have projects going on, where sits the uh, looking obviously at the higher risk uh, ingredients and activities. Uh, and then we, we called together like a bigger uh, cross-functional working group where we were also supported again by externals and in this case it was WWF uh, who was supporting us in discussing where will we now focus first our efforts, what is our key priority. And this resulted then, uh, we made two lists of high-risk ingredients, one for the land-based uh, risk and one for the water-based risk. So you have, uh, and we focus mainly on our ingredients because as a food business, I think our biggest risk sits in the procurement of ingredients. That was clear. Um, so it was really good to have a bit this, this mirror in front of the organi organization to decide where is the biggest risk. 
but also in just starting this conversation, it opened up a much more long-term discussion with teams that are otherwise very operational. So that was really, I think, uh, the big advantage of working with this strict metholo methodology, forcing us into looking at the longer term. Great, La last question for me, what's next? Are you considering setting targets using V1 that's coming out in March of science-based targets for nature, or how are you seeing operationalizing target 15? But I think definitely we have started the journey, we see the benefits, we want to continue. Uh, so we will, uh, I, we, we see when the guidance comes out, but our next step is definitely to, to set targets. I think one of the big challenge for us will be how do we then match them with the strategy that is already in place? How do we get that internal engagement and get the full company behind that? Because that um, is a struggle a bit to what I was saying at the start. We need to get companies to speak by diversity. And I think that will only happen if more companies join uh, the experimentation, start to use the methodologies, speak about it. Um, and in parallel, I think setting targets is one thing, but I think in parallel, really, we need to continue the action and translate everything into making uh, action on the ground. Great. Um, I would like to just take a minute here to see if there's a question from anyone physically in the room or online. Again, we're using Slido for this function, so I'm, I'm just going to give it a moment here to see if there's a burning question we get to before we move on to the panel. Oh, thanks, Gerard. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you, very interesting. Um, and I'm, I really picked up on what you said about within an, uh, an organization, being able to talk to climate is now relatively easy, and nature biodiversity is not so easy, and in our organization it's the same thing. How have you approached that internally? Do you have any recommendations about um, having that discussion so that people really do understand the link between the two and they see it as being just as important as climate? Well, uh, this whole process actually um, helps us a bit to what I was saying, like to make it insightful, where is the, where sits your impact and to open up the discussion, I think it really helps. And in that one, I think it's very important to find a balance. Maybe you can do um, a very high scan of where your impact sits, bring some examples. Next to that, I think what is being discussed here, the, the framework, if we can get a tool, a tool, if we can get an agreement globally like that, it will be uh, almost automatically that companies will start speaking about it. And that's a bit, I think, what's also missing in climate. You can speak on the Paris Agreement, you speak about a one and a half degree pathway, and everybody knows what you are talking about. And we need that kind of language on biodiversity. I think the, the first step is just to, to speak about it and to start finding uh, moments to, to bring it, maybe on the back of climate, link it to that one, to your targets, or um, yeah, hopefully to the framework soon. Great, thank you, Ava. Please join me in thanking Ava for being brave and <laughs> letting me put her on the spot. And now I'd like to welcome up to the stage our panel. First, our moderator, Nadine McCormick, who is a manager with Nature Action at WBCSD. We also have Renata Pellini, the nature lead at Wholesome, Christiana Lamarca, the head of environment at NNL, and Claire Lund, the VP of sustainability for GSK. And Nadine's gonna have her fangirl moment first. <laughs> Wow, that's really cool. Look at you all. <laughs> so yeah, my name is Nadine McCormick, World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Before I come to our wonderful panel here, just to kind of put this session in context and why this conversation is so important. Um, who was at the last session at TNFD SBTN? Who managed to get in? I think it was quite full. 
Oh, that's good. Oh, good, good. Because some of <laughs> you won't get too much of a repeat. One of the key messages... Oh, my God, I have a mask on. Somebody should have told me. One of the key messages that was shared, a recurring theme, is accountability, right? We know that business needs to take action. We know there needs to be high ambition. Um, there needs to accelerate the action. And we need to get these accountability loops working. And so the SBTN is a critical framework in this accountability system setting that high ambition like SBTI does for the climate accountability system and how this then feeds into driving the actions that are needed to halt and reverse the loss of nature and then disclosing on all of that to be able to then inform the finance institutions, the governments and civil society and consumers to make their choices. So this really is a key part of the system. We have to make it all work. Um, another way of framing that is the ACT D framework. You might have heard of that ACT D. Who's heard of ACT D? That's not as many as I was hoping. Okay, so assess, commit, transform, and disclose. When you look at what we're asking companies to do, to assess all their impacts and dependencies in their direct operations and upstream and downstream, and then uh, make science-based targets, and then uh, transform the whole company and their value chain and disclose on all of that, I think you can appreciate this is quite a tall order. It's absolutely what is needed. But some of you are companies are like, huh, actually, how, how do I do that? We, we did a poll a couple of days ago, whatever day that was, and we had a poll in the room, how many, people, how many companies or the companies you're working with are starting their journey, are developing, or leading in advanced. Um, two-thirds of the room were starting. They're on the, what is nature? What is our relationship with nature? So I think just to kind of put this in context, we need to get it right. We need to learn from leading companies. So it's in the spirit of that that we're going to be asking some kind of challenging questions. In the meantime, a little plug that we do have guidelines that uh, WBCC just released, which tries to make an on-ramp for when you're starting to assess, where do you start? Your first commitments when you're getting started, what are they? Where do you start taking those actions to transform and disclose to create this on-ramp to get companies to go much more quickly? Anyway, I probably went on too long. Uh, the other thing is that we're developing guidance for helping companies and dive into sectors. And so it's probably by no coincidence here if we think about the, those with the highest impacts and dependencies, we've got land base, which are kind of represented along a long value chain with GSK, Claire. We've also got built environment, so represented by building materials, Renata from Holcim. And we also have energy systems, represented by Christiana from NL. So this is a common theme. Let's keep um, being uh, precise on the details. So I'm going to come to Renata, you first. So as a company in the built environment system, why is your organization interested in science-based targets for nature? I saw that was a question, by the way, in Slido. Tom, wherever you are, here or online. So thank you for that question. Why, why is uh, Wholesome interested in setting science-based targets? And how do you hope SBTs for nature are going to feed into the outcomes in your company, your sector, and, and broadly more society? Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. So. I'm the head of nature at HOSIM, and first of all, I would like to um, talk about what is HOSIM, you know, what's our business. So we are producing cement aggregates, concrete, roofing, many materials that are going to be used on the construction. And uh, I think all of you know, but uh, the construction sector is uh, contributing to 37% of the world's CO2 emissions. And also, in terms of nature dependencies, we are the largest highly dependent sector, followed by agriculture, food, and beverage. A lot of people do not know that, but uh, this is um, really the case. So on the climate front, uh, we do have set, we set targets, uh, and our targets were validated by the Science-Based Target Initiative uh, across the value chain, so in our own operations and uh, scope uh, two and three. And we would like to do the same for nature. We want nature to be at the same level as climate. As Eva, the previous speak, speaker mentioned, climate and nature are interlinked, uh, and we want to make sure that they are at the same level. So in terms of what we expect from the guidance, I think it's really, if 
I think we all love nature, right? So if you want to see a real change on the ground, on nature, we need to set science-based targets because they're really uh, setting the, nat the new nature standard. And then I'm just gonna chat to you about it because actually, Wholesome, you have a really ambitious strategy as well, right? It's not just science-based targets in isolation, but it's part of a broader strategy and in informing that, right? Yes, yes, definitely. So I think we took a very bold approach. We launched our nature strategy uh, in 2021 when the science-based target for nature was not there <laughs> uh, yet. Uh, and, but when we launched, we knew this was coming. And uh, what we agree is that we are going to launch, but we are going to be part of the science-based target for nature. We're going to support this framework to make sure that it's applicable for business and also to make sure that we are there we are flexible enough to adapt in case we need to adapt our targets. Great. Okay, I'll be coming back to you in a minute. Christiana, coming to you now. All right, so same question though, right? But this okay. time you're an energy company. So what's the benefit to your company of setting science-based targets for nature? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me here because I think it's very important to share experience uh, and also challenges that we have uh, in this path to development uh, common road map. And for who, who doesn't know, Enel, Enel is uh, an Italian e electricity utility that operates around the world. We are present mainly in Europe, but also in uh, South America and North America. We manage energy production, distribution, and services, also uh, immobility infrastructure. And now we are operating uh, 50 gigawatt of renewables, and by 2030, the group expects to reach a total renewable capacity of 150 uh, gigawatt, tripling the 2020 portfolio. And uh, Enel is committed to zero emission by 2030, both for direct and indirect emission, and we already have certified our reduction on CO2, and we are uh, renewing this uh, certification with Science-Based Target Initiative. Enel is also committed uh, uh, preserving biodiversity and the reason I'm here, not only because uh, we depend on nature, but mainly because we impact on nature, generating a risk, financial and transitional risk for our company, and a loss for the uh, people that we live, uh, the community that we live with us. For the reason we recognize the importance of uh, steering the decision-making process through the, the definition of specific target. And this methodology uh, will provide a detailed guidance for the companies who are willing to set the target specific for all each pressure that are material to their business. And this is very important for us. As a utility, we, are material to, we have a material contribution primarily towards uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, we have the target on this, but we also are material on water use for cooling and for power generation, indoor power, and land use change, having a so big, so huge pipeline in solar and wind installation. And the outcome that I expect from uh, the, the application of this guidance uh, is um, an effective, robust, uh, and also uh, practical support for all the companies that want to start this journey. And uh, also an help to, that we need to deal with the complexity of our boundaries. Thank you. No, I like you, you've, you've framed a lesson in there already. So actually any company can get started. That starting point is actually the materiality. Yes. And, you know, that, that came up in our conversation this morning, our TNFD yes. piloting workshop, right? There's no point setting a target if it's not on the things that are material, right? Yeah. So, yeah. That's true. Yeah, and, and then this break. Is the first step. Yeah, and yeah. it's breaking, gives it a way to break down that complexity. So, yeah, no, really good. All right, I'll come back to you later. Claire, it's going to be the same question. <laughs> so, yeah, GSK, why? What's the value to GSK for setting science based targets for nature? Thank you. Well, I'm not going to do who's GSK because, frankly, you can look that up. So, I'm going to talk more about why we're here and what we're trying to achieve, which is actually about recognizing that healthy people need a healthy planet. So when you look up GSK, you'll realize why we're talking about that. So 
we do recognize that climate and nature are interlinked. And actually, we set a goal in 2020, very similar to Renata, which was, look, we've got to set bold, ambitious targets, get the organization behind us, and drive nature into that agenda early. We took, quite frankly, a bit of a fear factor uh, in terms of these were not established methodologies. We, these were not established targets. Um, but we know, <laughs> intrinsically, that you have to have both. So let's go for it, let's set the ambitious direction and then mobilize the organization and the sector uh, across that. So we set net zero and nature positive or contributing to nature positive by 2030, again, across the entire value chain. So that's not just our own operations, that's upstream and also downstream as well. So then to your question, why is it important? Frankly, then it does actually provide us that credibility. It does provide us that science based approach, which is extremely important to a science-based company um, and to scientists that live within our company to understand what we're focusing on, how it's measurable, how it relates to planetary boundaries, which for scientists is a concept that's really well understood, but when you start to talk to the finance teams, the procurement teams and other functions within a corporate, they literally glaze over. So we're having to break it down into real tangible, what does this mean? What actions can you take in your function, in your department? What does it look like in terms of water, fresh water quality? What does it look like in terms of water pollution? What does it look like in terms of materials, circularity, waste, biodiversity, all of those interrelated plays? So for us being part of the, of the early adopter pieces on, on the science-based targets, is putting that framework around it so that you've got the guardrails, as it were, to actually know where to go and how to drive towards that. It doesn't mean that we're stopping the actions and the programs we've already got in place. And I just want to make that crystal clear. This is actually about continuing to build on what is already there. So we've taken what we call no regret actions and targets on water, on biodiversity, on waste and materials so that we're actually moving and taking action at the same time as working on the sort of refinement, I would call it, of the methodology and the structure towards that. So hopefully that gives you the right answer. <laughs> it does, it does. But actually, there's two anonymous questions in here. If you want a shout out, put your name and I'll do a, a shout out to you. But two people have asked related questions back to this benefits here. Somebody saying, what's the shareholder reaction like? Somebody saying, how have your customers reacted to the work? I don't know if some, one of you wants to pick up on that. Just if there's been a customer reaction or a shareholder reaction or not yet. I Maybe mean, can, I can comment on that. In terms of uh, investors, uh, we are seeing more and more questions on, on nature. Uh, before I was only climate, but now I'm uh, participating in many more calls with investors and meetings with investors, and they are asking, what do you do in nature? And some of them are starting to understand and ask, uh, is it uh, science-based, or are you part of the science-based um, uh, target for nature? Are you part of the TNFD, Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosure? So I think it's starting. Um, it's a journey, but um, I, can, I can see a change from past years uh, to now. Yeah. I can take it also. Uh, it's the same for, uh, for us. Also, in my experience, uh, a lot of investors ask us if we are committed and ask us if we are joined and we are dis uh, um, developing the process with the NFD on same base target. So we had a lot of, for the first time in my life, I had a, a discussion with the investor directly, mm. joined by my team, because they were not able to answer, of course. So it's moving, it's moving and pushing. Well, I'm gonna answer with the progressive investors and shareholders are getting this, which is fantastic, and we're having some very positive conversations with those. We're actually still having to almost educate non-progressive asset owners and, and value-based shareholders. So I think there is, that movement is coming, which is extremely important. We're part of the working group on TNFD as well, of course. So it is coming from that lens. It needs to come more because that actually does support corporates very much as well. Um, and I would say that our customers, by the way, are patients. So um, I think most people who have ever had any form of respiratory illness or anything like that know the connection intricately <laughs> with nature and health already. So, so that awareness on a human level, I think, is quite strong. Um, so it's really building that in uh, into what we're doing as well. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll go back on script again now. Okay. Um, 
So the next question is, you know, the guidance is out there. Um, what have you appreciated about the guidance? I think it's good to, you know, what have we appreciated about the guidance? And let's also be honest, it's a work in progress. So, you know, we, you have been testing it and we have been giving feedback back. Um, so what have been the challenges that you've fed back to the, um, the, the network? And, you know, yeah, how are, how are we working to help them make it ambitious and practical? So uh, maybe I'll go reverse order this time. Yeah, why not? Claire, I'll do Claire <laughs> Christiana, Renata. Right. Thanks. That way then uh, you have to copy all the... No. <laughs> um, what do we appreciate? Frankly, the fact that it's coming out because we have been operating a bit of an isolation uh, framework on this without having that support from the science-based uh, initiative and, and na uh, network. So ally uh, alliances behind that are great. And I think one of the key things that we're really quite proud of working with the teams is that these are now starting to line up. Frankly, none of us in the corporate world really want more and more and more different disclosures and different methodologies because I really don't want my team or the teams within the GSK working on additional disclosures and additional reporting. I want them working on solutions. So actually the alignment is really critical and we've absolutely appreciated how the sort of network is really pulling that uh, in, in together and that's helping us phenomenally. The challenges are probably the same as probably everybody else is finding at the moment. Once you get past that first layer of understanding of impacts and dependencies, you then start to open an absolute rabbit warren of detail beneath that. So for us, it, you know, active pharmaceutical ingredients is a compound. So think of a, a cake. We're now having to actually get into the flour, the sugar, the butter within that uh, process as well. So really getting into the detail uh, and the complexity of those origins of supply chain and uncovering covering actually that the cake, using the, carrying on using the analogy, might actually be masking some of the real detail beneath that. So actually the flour is more important than the total cake, and that's where the real impact is coming. So we're really getting into that level of granularity, and I think that's the, the challenges as we work through with the methodology is really getting into that real granular. Where is the real impact, and how do we, how do we work on that? And it's to build on that, actually, you said on another panel before, is it 30,000 suppliers you have or something? So let's not leave it at, like, it's really complex. What have you done about those 30,000? How have you narrowed down? Yeah, 30,000 global suppliers um, <laughs> plus. So it is about breaking it down. So it does look terrifying, scary, and it's a really difficult work, world to work out how to start, but it is working through what is the first tier, so where do you start with that? What looks, frankly, common sense and logical? So, you know, where we've got paper, right, well, that's clearly a deforestation uh, risk, so let's start going down that pathway. So it is using... The first framing is, is common sense to, to filter that. The next framing is getting lower and lower and lower. So we've actually started beyond all of those 30,000, we've actually started with 12 high-risk materials. So you do start to funnel it quite quickly. It doesn't mean we're stopping and it doesn't mean we're only doing 12, but that's really how you start to focus it down and narrow. And again, part of this is build, build, build on this, build the journey, build the understanding and actually share. So one of the areas it's not just our own impacts, and you're probably going to come to this, it's the wider sector, the wider ecosystem that we live in, and how we really work with the partners in that space as well. Cool. Thank you. All right, Christiana, what do you appreciate about the guidelines, and what challenges have you come up against? That you've uh, uh, first, uh, what I appreciate most was the ambition and the coherency of the guidelines. Well, uh, ambition and... Coherency. Coherency. I'm, I say well. Clarity. 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 Co clarity. Clarity, maybe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, and also the scientific driven approach that I hope will lead to a more comprehensive uh, open data assessment that we need, also in a day by day operation that we have uh, right now. The inclusion of stakeholder engagement in the target setting, which is very important, although as a utility we already are subject to public authorities and negotiation with the local community when we start an activity in a place, so it's something that we know very well. And also the practical reference to available tools that you can find in the guideline. Um, in the road test we were involved, uh, we also realized that the process is onerous and, um, and can be affected by the lack of uh, availability of data and the time required to gain this data to, to assess the data. 
And moreover, another aspect is that uh, not in all the geography, at least where we are present, uh, are the public authorities uh, organized or accountable to support this kind of process. This is a very important point, at least for the guideline on fresh water, for example. And um, the two main challenges that I see are the first, the task to cover uh, do, uh, no, the task to convert uh, group level footprint or framework to in site specific target setting and vice versa because sometimes it's not easy to, uh, to make a synthesis of uh, this specific target at group level. And this is the first uh, uh, challenge for us because we need to have uh, an overall uh, site and approach also for the stakeholder, of course, and the shareholder view and investor, and the other task is to cover the diversity of the supply chain as well. I'm meaning tier one at the moment. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's it possible manageable to assess and reduce the impact of the value chain locally. I mean in construction, operation, demolition, and repurposing of a plan of an infrastructure uh, but the supply chain assessment, it will be global. I'm thinking about buying panel, PV panel, or wind turbines. So, I mean, and other commodities. So the upstream uh, activities uh, data uh, assessment will be onerous, and we, uh, we need to simplify at the very beginning in order to understand where we have data readiness and what kind of data we can rely on also to do this kind of evaluation. Yeah, no, so traceability has really come up as a prerequisite to be able to get some of this information. And, you know, there's good traceability on those high-risk commodities. I used to work on biofuels in the olden days, and I remember soy traders going, it's impossible to get traceability on soy. Now, the traceability's there. It's getting better. So now we need it, like, to expand. You know, maybe we need a roundtable on sustainable solar panels. Is that what you're saying? I don't know, but like, yeah, yeah, when you buy, you're buying your yeah, panels. I remember your colleague saying, well, we buy our panels from China. We know we buy them from China, but that's as far as it goes. So how can we get traceability for all these other? Yeah, they haven't got on the radar yet. Yeah, cool. All right. Renata, what do you appreciate about the guidelines and what challenges have you shared? Right, so maybe two insights on what do I appreciate. I think the first thing is really the dialogue uh, uh, the science based studies for nature is having with the business. In the world of today, we need to have this dialogue, otherwise it will be a uh, guidance that nobody will apply. And, uh, in, and so we need to have this balance uh, of a framework that is science based, but is also practical to the business. So this dialogue that they are having with the business is, is, is a must and, and, and it's happening quite well. And the second thing I appreciate is that the guidance is quite logical and practical. It starts very broad, um, measuring uh, your materiality, so where you have most of your impacts, and then you narrow down to measure your impacts, um, and then uh, the state of nature. Uh, so it, it, then you set the targets on, 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 on where you have most of the impact. So it's quite logical and practical, and these are, uh, it's really, um, I really appreciate. Now, a challenge, um, that uh, we face at hosting is that when we think about the value chain, so in our own operations, we, we have primary data. We, do, we are quite uh, well placed. In the upstream suppliers, we also are quite well placed. And um, <laughs> we have, just to make a, um, a comment, you have 30,000 suppliers. We have in tier one, 100,000 suppliers, 80% SMEs. <laughs> but we do uh, have a clear understanding of, of the impacts. We use a tool called ExoBase, and uh, I'm glad the um, Science Based Art of Financial recommended this tool. If you don't have primary data, you could use this tool to assess our impact on the suppliers. And uh, we do use this tool since 2014, so we are quite uh, well placed on that. But the challenge is on the downstream. The uh, whole team is very decentralized. Uh, we are a very decentralized company, and not necessarily we track um, our end users. Uh, so we have a challenge on, on this, how to measure the impact on the downstreams with our customers. And um, it, this was a challenge for us. And when I saw the guidance uh, that is out there, 
there was there is not, not a um, specific guidance from downstreams so this means that the science the scientists are also struggling um, how to measure impacts on the downstream so this um, was a bit of a relief for us but it's a challenge and we are happy to work with uh, science-based study for nature to find ways to, to measure downstream uh, impacts because we think it's important and we should include um, in, in our um, uh, targets. Yeah. yeah, no, great. And you've actually brought that background to your first point. The, you know, the benefit is actually working this out together. This is complex and actually working together, we can try and find some of those answers. It actually gives me a nice segue to also like shout out to the corporate engagement program. So I asked the team like the latest numbers, how many um, partners are there in the corporate engagement program? There are 179 right now, comprised of 99 companies and 60, oh damn it, I've left it on that, 60 something partner yeah. companies. Um, can we just do a little raise of hands, actually? Like, how many companies here are in the corporate engagement program? Ooh, cool. All right, so have a little look around if you want to talk to somebody in the corporate engagement program. If you're a partner in the corporate engagement program, put up your hand. What? Okay, that's not many of us. All right, okay. So we're the ones who are also engaging in the content and then bringing it back to the companies that we're working with and helping them understand because, yeah, it's a learning journey. It's like a book club, basically. Here's the reading list this time. Let's see if we can get what's our feedback on this one. So uh, maybe you could be the 100th uh, company in the Corporate Engagement Program. If you want to join the Corporate Engagement Program, Jess, stand up. Yeah. You can speak to Jess. All right, we've got some nice questions coming in. Remember Slido, the code is SBTN, very cool code. I'm jealous, I didn't know you could do that. Um, let's see, there's loads of cool questions in here. Um, there's one from Anonymous. Um, on the TNFD SBTN alignment, so I'm following, up on that, uh, following on the investor question. So how does your work on TNFD and SBTN align in practical terms? And where are the gaps? I don't know if one of you want to take them. I can, I can start, but in terms of practical terms, we've actually run them together. So that was the sensible, smart approach, <laughs> frankly, for us, uh, because mainly it's the same team working on it. So um, we looked at both the impacts through the SBTN aspect and then the dependencies primarily through the TNFD pieces. And frankly, you know, it is working with the same data. <laughs> so it is pulling it from just slightly different lenses and looking at it from uh, different approaches in terms of which of the areas in water, for example, would actually link us from an impact or a risk. What's the cost, the financial valuation of that? What's the physical valuation of that in terms of then a target setting? So actually, same data, just looking at it from slightly different lenses in, in most approaches. So we ran it at the same time. There are some differences, and I know science-based targets are well aware of this, which is you know, this, the sort of overarching aspect and then the sectoral piece. So marine is not fully there yet. Um, and of course, we know we've got some areas that we've got to work in in that space. And, and to Renata's point about the downstream as well, we're not ignoring that. So we are actually already building that in as we go. So I think there are some, uh, running it in parallel is absolutely smart, but there are still some gaps in that space. Um, but again, it comes back to, we're not waiting until those gaps are fully filled. We're actually looking and applying the logic and the, and the sound thinking around that as well. Maybe I can compliment. I think um, the TNFD is a risk management and disclosure framework. Um, the disclosure part, there is um, a, a, a set of targets that need to be disclosed. And there is where um, the science-based target for nature helps. But there are other disclosures in the TNFD that it's not really related to the science-based study furniture, like governance disclosures and, and other type of disclosures. So they are different. Um, they are very complementary, and I'm glad they are also working together <laughs> to speak the same language. And the same thing as Claire said, HOSIM, we decided to join both together, and it was a very, very smart decision. And one recommendation I give for companies is to have one person join both together because this really helps uh, to be efficient, to connect the dots easier, and also to be there in the front, uh, front of the, 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 the new nature standard that's coming up. Yep. Yep. Go, yes, I can add to this also that uh, with science-based target, we can use the materiality evaluation 
to build on the risk assessment that we have in TNFD. So, I mean, what we are doing to do a sort of materiality with the leading of uh, the guideline or science-based target and then evaluate our risk and opportunities analysis about uh, on what we are materials. So we can build on the each other. And so this is, but it, it's, it's really, it's real that also the, 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 the final goal is different. So in one case, we have to define our risk, mitigate the risk and disclose about the risk and in a also financial terms. In the other case, we have to set uh, science-based targets specific and monitor the improvement of nature of that site level. So they are different. True. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And yeah, it's maybe a good reminder back to that ACT D framework. It's really clear. Like, if you're thinking, "Oh my goodness, I'm bamboozled with all these tools," but what's your question? What What do you need? And is it about really like setting targets, like the clues in the name? Um, if is it around disclosures, well, I suppose they do risk assessment too, but really thinking about what is your question and recognizing there's different purposes. There's a lot of other tools out there as well, especially when you look at sectors and that earlier stage of mat uh, maturity and companies, so more ac uh, easier to access tools. What we're talking about is really like, you know, the creme de la creme, you know, like these are the advanced ones. Um, so yeah, just having that in mind if you're trying to navigate the tools. Um, so I have another question. I think it was another anonymous one. A minute, let me just check. Um, yeah, I think it's back to like how you get this through into your companies. I mean, this is partly, these are technical challenges we're talking about. There's also a huge change agenda here, an organizational change agenda. So, where's the, who answered this? Who asked this one? Oh, yeah, it was Ed, Ed, the biodiversity consultancy, shout out. Um, Claire made a good point earlier about trying to get that co internal company support. What have been your challenges internally? Oh, they all laughed, did you see that? <laughs> what have been well, your challenges <laughs> internally and how are you, have, you, have you overcome them or are you in the process of overcoming them? Who wants to take that one first? Go, Claire. Well, I can jump in, and, I, and apologies for those that heard me say this a couple of days ago, but part of this actually is a mindset shift, and it's a cultural change. So actually, while we want the science, we want the methodology, we want the credibility of the right direction, the right targets, it's also about changing people's consciousness to bring in nature, biodiversity, water, into thinking for normal business uh, decision making. So there is a huge change program about bringing that into sort of, like I said before, about procurement colleagues or finance colleagues or HR and actually really bringing this home to what it actually means for them. So part of the job that we're doing uh, at GSK and we do have huge C-suite support and, and, and um, well, pressure, frankly, uh, to make sure that we're delivering against the commitments we set, which is fantastic. So we've got that top level support and drive, but we're now getting into translating that to what does it mean for those various departments or various people that can actually affect change and deliver that. So again, TNFD has actually been a great help on that because that has really woken the entire finance community up, which is fantastic. They're fully embedded and really driving that through as well. Um, procurement, we've got colleagues uh, really actively driving this now with our suppliers. We've got teams working on products which are looking at the avoid, uh, reduce pieces that fit within that as well. So it's the change program is really a huge momentum, so it is a mindset shift, but actually part of the job we've been doing is translating it in terms of what does that mean if you're sitting in procurement? What does that mean if you're sitting in choosing a supplier? What does that mean if you're looking at a product or a landscape? And actually helping that unlock that consciousness that you were probably already thinking about nature, and I used this example recently where engineers are already looking at how to optimize processes. Well, that's normally energy. Now they've added water, waste materials. Oh, and look at that, biodiversity. So actually, you, you've got a lot of that thinking there, and you've got brilliant people, especially in our organization, doing a lot of these programs. And we've now added that consciousness to it, and it's actually given them an amazing permission to actually say, well, I've always thought about doing this brilliant circularity with solvents project because it would probably would have saved money, but now I've got the lens of it's actually a really positive nature benefit and a climate benefit, which two sides of the same coin, can, I, can we move forwards on this now? So it's really unlocked a lot of opportunity uh, within the organization for us as well. Anyone else want to answer on change? No I question. can compliment. I think uh, the main challenge we're facing at Holcim is really to put nature at the same level as climate. 
because everybody understood uh, in the building material sector that climate is important and we are really tackling the right way. But nature, we need to raise the bar. We need to sh showcase that it's important. As the same, that has the same importance and should have the same attention as climate. Um, and to Claire's point on the, the leadership, uh, I'm glad uh, that at the whole team we, we do have leadership behind. I report directly to the Chief Sustainability and Innovation Officer, which is, <laughs> which is here in front of us. And this is quite important to have this leadership um, endorsement uh, because you, you, you find easier opportunities to expose what you do and what's the importance of this um, for, for, for the senior leaders. Great. Okay. Do you want to answer or let me go? Yeah, good. So um, I have a bit of segue into procurement. So Anonymous asked uh, about those smaller companies in the supply chain and which function would you invest in when staffing up the company then to start that process in the supply chain? Is it, well, is R&D, supply chain, procurement? Like how are you, yeah, when you're engaging down in the supply chain? So it was in the food sector, but you also mentioned you have even more suppliers. So yeah, how, when you're then skilling up in the company, where do you need to invest to do that? Procurement. Okay, there we go. That's the answer. Procurement. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Supported by us, but the procurement who has for evidence and document and certification and process and so on. So the procurement has to be engaged. And it's not easy. Yeah. Are you doing like training other programs and stuff for them? Are you doing like what is nature type programs? or Internally? Yeah, yeah sure. We took one year to make all on the same level of attention about the, to the topic. And now we are starting working at group level and also at business line level with engineering and the procurement and so on. So, but it's a process. Mm -hmm. Ongoing. Mm -hmm. Anyone else to tell? Well, again, we're probably very lucky. Our chief procurement officer is extremely engaged on this topic, um, which is, again, fabulous. Um, and actually really driving that through in terms of capability building and working with the suppliers, not just the large ones, because actually a lot of the large ones are already on this journey already, but really how do we take that down to the small and medium enterprises as well? So again, working with partners that we do with Manufacture 2030, where there's direct opportunity to work with smaller and medium organizations to provide practical advice, practical support. So that's what we're investing in, um, as well as not just our procurement teams, but also with the right solutions that can access our suppliers or partners um, through the supply chain as well. So it is a capability and a learning journey, but actually it's, it's a, an extremely rapid one. Once you get people to unlock, and I said before, unlock the mindset, unlock the realization that these are win-win-win opportunities, which they are in most cases, it flies mar much faster. And actually what we're trying to do from a central sustainability team is actually get out of the way. Nice. Okay, we are starting to get to the end of this part, so I'll be soon coming to you for your final words of advice and a note to, to the SBTN team, there's two questions for you in here, I think. Um, I'm really glad an uh, anonymous person asked this question because it's kind of my learning edge for the last few days. So both SBTN and TNFD are quite light in the inclusion of people, particularly the impacts and contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities. So if and how do you address this gap? Oh, do you want to? Oh, okay. Well, um, I think I'd like to know I, because I've been asking all our member companies this, like these last days, what are, what are you doing <laughs> on engaging local communities, and indigenous people? So I, this is a, probably a bit on the spot. Um, would somebody like to con? Well, um, I, I say that uh, we already are in this process because when we build a power plant or a, uh, an asset, we have to. Uh, follow a permitting process which involve also the area in which the, the, the stakeholder and sometimes we have also to deal with indigenous people so it's something that we have in other, in, we, I would say we do uh, environmental and social impact assessment at the very beginning of our process and then we design and uh, we do the feasibility and so on so I mean uh, practically if we have already this approach. In, with this guideline, it's more clear the effect and the importance to having in this definition of the target. So, good. So, as a starting point, yeah. 
Well, I can, I can again probably build on that, and again, part of this is the journey. So when you do the impact materiality and understanding, it's really obvious quite quickly that you win and lose at a local level. So you're then really into engaging with the local community immediately. And actually, we could do the best, I don't know, we'll pick water reduction project in the world, but actually that water basin won't improve. So if we don't engage the communities, we don't engage the other neighbors in that uh, water basin, then that will never improve. So we'll never actually meet the science-based commitments and requirements if we don't do that. So projects that we're looking at and programs are already moving into that agenda. So in Indonesia, in India, we're working with the local communities very hard now to actually listen, understand where the opportunities are. And actually it's, it's fantastic in terms of surprising insights that we're getting, which is actually it's not this project that would make the difference in the impact, it's actually this one. And you know, water and sanitation is a big one that's coming through for us as well, because that obviously links with health. So it's, it's a really good engagement that we're getting the richness of having that conversation when we're starting to look at the projects, the programs, and then realizing you can't deliver any of these targets unless you engage with the local communities. And so yeah, we're, we're finding that across the projects, but it's, it's building and building and building as we go through. What I'm also, by the way, loving about being here is that opportunity to listen and to actually be here. So part of the reason that we're here, not just to be on panels and talking about it and sharing our uh, experiences and learnings, but also so that we can listen and understand where we can do more. So at Holcim, we do have a policy, a human rights policy in place, and also a nature policy, and the golden rule is to proactive engage with local stakeholders. So we do need to engage with communities, and I completely agree with Claire that uh, without uh, this engagement, uh, it's, it's getting difficult, our life, you know, our business. So it's very, very important um, on both sides, you know, uh, when there we have problems, but also when we have opportunities to really work close to them um, the whole way through. Okay, learning journeys everywhere as well. But no, thank you, whoever added that question. Um, so I'm going to ask the panel now just to share like their last um, words of advice to companies or individuals who are working with companies. So a flurry of last questions that have come in, though. Like, how big is your team? Did you use anybody that's external? Do you do it in-house? Is there any third party? So in case any of your lessons might relate to that, maybe um, answer to those. And then I'll hand over to SBTN to answer those last two questions. I may start. So um, basically, it's pretty much everything in house. The only thing we um, we do with consultants is the Excel base, so the uh, upstream analysis, the impact on the upstream. We use a consultant for that uh, because it's 100,000, as I mentioned, 100,000 <laughs> suppliers, um, most of them SMEs, so we use an, an, uh, a consultant for that. But uh, apart from that, it's all um, in house. And so your last word of advice is to. I think be bold, um, go for it. Uh, I believe we don't have time to, to wait. I mean, we are already at the end of 2022. Um, 2023 is there and we need to reverse natural loss and uh, possibly be positive by 2030. And uh, it's seven years. Seven, year is, yeah. it's seven years is very, very few. It's a few time for nature to thrive. So we need to put actions in place. and. Uh, make sure that uh, I, uh, you are um, um, uh, with knowledge on the science-based targets for nature guidance, but also the TNFD, and, um, and, and just go for it, because we need actions for everybody to make sure we have a real impact on the ground. Here, here. Yes. Okay. Christiana. My advice is to start from what you are very material as an impact, so, so internally understand which is your main goal, what you are uh, significant to you, and then decide which is the, the target you want to reach. And so, so le later on, make uh, um, be helped by others, so more specific uh, uh, co competencies. But it's important to, to make this preliminary analysis inside and also inside, and also try starting also with the specific boundaries, a geographical or specific business, not to everything together, in order to better understand the impact that this can have on your business and the action that you have to take later. So this is my advice. And of course, it's different for the dimension of the company that you have. As NL, we decide to do internally this screening and later on to 
to develop a site level with some criteria and methodology to deliver to the people on site that maybe can be external to perform. Uh, and a smaller company can have a problem to do this, but anyway, start uh, from one part and then decide how to increase the, the perimeter. Yeah. Very wise words, yes. Build on that, um, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, uh, start was, was probably my first uh, piece of advice, but the other one is start asking the right questions. Because often when we found, when we start, and, and the question around how big's the team and how do we work with partners, we do absolutely work with partners, we do work with suppliers, we do have a team. We have teams now across the company as well, uh, nested within, like I said, procurement and finance as well. So it's not just about a central sustainability team, it's now building that across the organization as well. But where it, a lot of it started from after the materiality and, and sort of starting work on stuff was actually asking the right questions. You know, is that supplier sitting in a water-stressed region? Very basic question, but it starts to really trigger uh, the right people asking the, or thinking about the right thing, and then it starts to open up a lot of channels into that space. But there's a lot of guidance, there's a lot of allies in this space, so reach out to the leading companies, reach out to the corporate engagement network. There are support networks. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> okay, massive round of applause, please, for our panel. Thank you so much for your honesty, your energy, your enthusiasm. Um, great. SBTN, do you have the questions? I do. And also, yeah. um, a hand for Nadine, please, too. Thank you, Nadine. So, uh, as we come to the closing part of this session, um, I would like to respond to the questions that are more directed to the SBTN team more so than the companies themselves. Um, and uh, the first one that I see here is if the goals of the biodiversity framework are not strong enough, is SBTN planning to issue more scientifically robust targets? Varsha, would you like to grab a mic? Sure, yeah, um, it's a tough question, honestly. Um, I think at, we jo at SPTN we join everyone else here in hoping for a really ambitious and effective GBS and one that is grounded in science, but if that doesn't happen, we aren't waiting and we haven't been. The science is really clear, it is sound. We're working together with our colleagues in order to produce scientifically rigorous methodologies and we'll continue to do so. Where we can point to global goals and policies, we'll take advantage of that, but otherwise we're ready. Thanks, Varsha, and I would add to that the strong scientific support for stopping the loss of nature by 2030, um, consistent with the bending the curve, and um, there is already, from my vantage point, pretty unstoppable momentum um, toward that, and so hopefully that will be uh, reinforced in the biodiversity framework, but, but even if it isn't, it, it will continue to be um, an orienting point for us. Um, we also had a question about the inclusion of people, and Varsha, I'm wondering if, if there's anything you'd like to complement what you heard from the companies themselves, because I know this uh, just came up in the TNFD session as well. Yeah, um, I think what we heard from the companies was really helpful perspective. Um, there's clearly already a lot that's being done, um, and the first is to kind of really recognize that. Um, in addition, we are aiming to provide additional guidance on stakeholder um, engagement as part of our um, guidance release in, in our version one of our methodologies. but humans are really an integral part of our methodology all the way through, from the connections to the global economy and to financial actors, as well as to the kind of perspectives of nature's contributions to people. So it's there, but we hope to kind of grow that portion of our methodology over time with our scientific developments. Thanks, Varsha. And uh, we had uh, one additional question here about does SBTN allow existing systems and methodologies to be used and enhanced? And first, I hope you heard a few examples of this on the panel in terms of existing tools uh, that we're pointing to, but I'd like to um, 
invite uh, Jess McGlynn, who runs our corporate engagement program, because she gets this question all the time. Jess. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, our design criteria for building our methods is to build and align with what's already out there. We really want to make sure that we're not creating extra work if we don't have to. So we've been really um, very careful about in all of our methods to make sure that we're incorporating what's already out there, what the companies are using, where it makes sense. And when it doesn't entirely fit, then what are some crosswalks to make on ramps to use our stuff? Sorry for my voice. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Jess. And um, I think critically, we have some of the leading um, sector collaborations participating in the corporate engagement program. Um, textiles Exchange being an example. And um, we really rely on them for sector specific uh, answers to that question. Um, and appreciate the um, wide tent that Jess has created in the corporate engagement program. So that gets me to uh, my last point here, which is hopefully you heard loud and clear, don't wait, we know it's complex, go ahead and get started. Um, some of the ways that um, you can get started um, if you aren't already engaged is that you can join our corporate engagement program, um, participating in the design phase as well as learning from um, leading peers in the, um, in the space. Um, we are a voluntary initiative. It is our intention to be equipping leading companies with the right direction that um, signifies sufficient ambition that, that they should aim to meet and exceed. We recognize the limitations to that, uh, which is why we hope by uh, defining that bar, we're accelerating the um, other aspects of accountability that need to follow, including but not limited um, to regulation um, that will be necessary to level the playing field. And I think you heard about uh, the need for the close ties between climate and nature. Just reiterating that we can't solve climate change without stopping nature loss. And climate change is one of the key drivers of nature loss. So not only should we be aiming for them to be side by side, but frankly, nature should be on, on top and, and climate nested within <laughs> in terms of our, our mid to long term uh, goal as a community. And so um, I encourage you to uh, join Finance and Biodiversity Day tomorrow. Our goal is to emphasize that the finance sector, especially the progressive parts of the finance sector, is ready to align on a strong biodiversity framework and that um, SBTN is one of the um, pieces of the puzzle, which is why we have been investing so much in alignment um, and collaboration with TNFD. Also within the broader Global Commons Alliance, we have the Accountability Accelerator hosting a session here tomorrow in the Nature Positive Pavilion at 4.30 on the role of finance. So hopefully you can join that as well. And thank you all for joining us. Happy to stay for a while afterwards. If you have any um, questions or feedback for us, uh, we welcome it. Thanks everyone.